Thank you, Zach. I am honored to reintroduce Marius Torda, who is a professor at Oxford Brookes University and director of its Center for Medical Humanities. He is also co-convener of this symposium. So with, with that, I'll say over to you, Marius, for our last question and answer session. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I've uh, greatly enjoyed these uh, two presentations and uh, I realize we have some extra minutes for the Q&A uh, for this session. So then with the permission of my colleagues, um, I just want to highlight two elements here because they were, I think, very important and we glossed over, uh, but we never uh, had time to discuss it properly. And I'm very pleased that my colleagues from the Holocaust um, Museum have highlighted that, particularly in the film that uh, uh, it was shown. So the first one is about the importance the Nazi regime placed uh, on the family. Uh, and it was clearly, we saw that the family was at the center of, of, of uh, the Nazi regime's demographic and eugenic program. Uh, so that's one thing. Secondly, the marriage of healthy German women and men was promoted. And uh, as Marx said, uh, the welfare strategies devised to encourage German families to have more children. So you have a very important uh, and uh, sustained conversation about the negative eugenic practices of the Nazi regime. But I think it's equally important to highlight the positive, if appropriate term here, uh, eugenic policies. Uh, so that's one thing. At the same time as the, the museum, very, uh, the collections and the exhibits uh, uh, clearly point out family research and the hereditary health of the, the family were popularized um, in well-attended exhibitions. Um, and the museum has uh, uh, in its collections examples of those Nazi exhibitions that traveled to the US. And I wanna mention this, I think it's important um, historical detail, um, uh, uh, an extremely important uh, public health exhibition that was organized in 1935 in Berlin uh, the Wonder of Life, yeah, Das Wunder des Lebens, as they called it. And that important exhibition traveled to the United States of America. And it was shown across various um, places. Uh, and it's interesting that actually uh, it was, there's was an important uh, discussion about what happened with that collection. Um, so they had the whole uh, positive aspects of uh, Nazi public health policies. And you mentioned very well in your presentation uh, some of that, the work particularly related to tuberculosis. Uh, but also, of course, the exhibition uh, explained very clearly to the American public the Nazi sterilization program um, and the disastrous consequences, as they put it, of allowing the reproduction of defective individuals. So I wanted to... to I had to be more to that wonderful presentation of yours about this. And in connection to public health, I think something that uh, needs to be said as well in connection to the Nazis is the successful uh, war on cancer they, they promoted, according to a, a very good book written by Robert Proctor. Uh, so uh, we know um, that um, the discussion about uh, the causes of cancer and how it could be treated, and uh, particularly the relationship the public health Nazi officials put on preventing uh, and campaign ba banning basically, in some cases, uh, smoking and drinking seen as uh, causes of cancer. It's very uh, eerie, of course, for us now to look back to, to anything the Nazi did and reinterpret that in, 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 with, with any uh, assumption of um, positivity. But it's important and I, I'm very, I was very, uh, excited and pleased to see your presentation, um, uh, Leah and Kathleen and Mark, because you're able to, to put together these aspects, which are, of course, very controversial uh, and it's not easy to put it all together. And you explain very well, I think, how you, 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 you translate that into explaining to visitors and people visiting and young people uh, and how do you use that in the classroom. Uh, so, um, with that in mind, uh, I, we, could, we could move to a, a conversation about these two important uh, papers and two important institutions. And uh, the first uh, comment I have, and then I'm going to pick some collections. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Lingli, and yeah, that's very important. Um, how do we teach about um, these uh, aspects of, of in the history of eugenics and Nazi uh, eugenics in connection to the Holocaust? I think it's essential 
uh, it's essential to uh, younger generation, of course, part of the uh, civic engagement, uh, learning about the past, um, remembering. But it's also important to uh, other generations who are not familiar uh, with that part uh, of history and not familiar with that part of the world and so on and so forth. And I think there are many ways to do that. The, the, the Holocaust Museum has a, a long history of doing that properly. Uh, you know, you can explain the views of individuals involved uh, in these activities as you do, uh, some prominent scientists or writers or politicians. You can discuss their ideas or the doctrines associated with political and social movements as you present it today. Or we can uh, discuss the controversy over uh, not, uh, noteworthy issues, important issues, as Zach uh, presented in, in his paper. So that's, that's one aspect. Or you could highlight the distinct feature of a period. Uh, we we'll look at the 1930s and then what happens, uh, of course, after 1939 with the outbreak of the Second World War and the onset of the Holocaust. Uh, or you look at the country uh, or countries as it happens under German occupation. So in other words, what I'm saying, what I, I, I realized and I, I, I particularly uh, liked in your presentations is that you highlighted both the elements of continuity, but also the discontinuity and how that could be uh, put together. So the first question I have to, to all of you um, is um, how, um, how can we uh, uh, do this uh, in a way that allows us to, uh, to tell a, a very complicated story, um, but at the same time remain, in a way, um, truth, uh, 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 remain uh, truthful to the principles that guide the institutions that we represent. Right? Uh, we, go, we fully embraced certain uh, ideas and we can explain them very clearly. Other, 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 other issues are more complicated. And Zach pointed that uh, very clearly and goes back to something what uh, direct, Director Green said in his opening remarks. This is the first time, basically, that uh, a, a conference on eugenics is being organized at the National Institute of Health, of course, uh, which is extraordinary important. Uh, so uh, if we can reflect a bit uh, on these issues, that is about engagement, it's about teaching, it's about um, memory, it's about the role of um, the institutions, then uh, it's something that we can pick up from where we left it in the previous discussion we had about the exhibitions. Um, and then we can see where this takes us. So who wants to go first? I, I can start if you don't mind. Um, so yeah, I think like in developing our resources, and obviously Marius, as you mentioned, you know we're we're the, the Genome Institute. You know we represent the NIH. So like, I think one of the things that we really tried to focus on in developing our um, our timeline and our fact sheet was obviously the history of eugenics is huge and it covers so many disciplines. It covers so many social spaces, so many institutions, just beyond science even. And I think what we really tried to hone in on is the sort of genetics and genomics. And genomics is obviously a very new field compared to genetics, but trying to stay as much focused in as we could on the arguments that eugenicists were making, relying on Mendelian inheritance and how those were misinterpreted or bad interpretations of that science at the time and how we've come to know it. Um, and trying to, again, keep our, our, our timeline specifically focused on bringing that, that heredit, the heredity and the genetics back to every part of what we were trying to convey to our audience um, is something that we were really trying um, to, to go for and, and stay true to our institute and, and tell the story in a way that felt true to our institute. Thank you. I think maybe um, we have a couple of examples from the museum. Um, first, Catherine can talk a little bit about um, a, faculty, a faculty seminar that's very shortly upcoming that, that touches on this topic. Uh, and then maybe Mark, you can talk a little bit about how you formulated those collections very mindfully in terms of how you included the story of eugenics among other things. So Catherine, do you wanna maybe start? I'd be happy to. So we have an upcoming 2022 Jack and Anita Hess faculty seminar. And the purpose of the seminar is to bring together scholars from the field of history, bioethics, uh, public health and medicine to discuss ways that we can, from an interdisciplinary perspective, think about the Holocaust and its implications, long-term implications um, on the various fields that we see scholars teaching it in. 
Um, and so the goal here, right, is to think about not only the legacies of Nazis' uses and abuses of scientific knowledge, uh, and the extent to which uh, we can teach that in the classroom, um, but then also to dig a little bit more deeply into ethical lessons that we can learn from the Holocaust, uh, ways we can see the implementation or lack of implementation of uh, lessons from the Nuremberg trials and the Nuremberg Code, uh, and then also just more specifically with a recent concerns around pathology and disease and COVID, uh, what some of the public health concerns today, um, what we can draw on from the Holocaust to better understand treating vulnerable populations and or access to treatment and vaccines. So we open this space, it's a small 20 person seminar for faculty to really learn from one another, to learn from some experts in the field. Uh, we will have both Patricia Haber Rice, who's the senior historian at the museum and has done a lot of work on the T4 campaign as one of the seminar leaders. And then also, also Matthew Winia, who comes in from the University of Colorado and teaches both in the bioethics and directs the bioethics program. Uh, and also works in the School of Medicine. So this is one of the ways that we're trying to sort of expand the influence of the use of our resources in a pedagogical way. Thank you. Mark, would you like to ask something, please? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, now, um, the question about how to effectively teach these complicated subjects is um, so difficult to answer, I think, because the context is always different. Depends on the audience you have in front of you. Uh, depends on the amount of time you have, on, on the resources you have available, on, on your students' uh, access to technology, et cetera. Um, and so when crafting the collections uh, for experiencing history, we had to take into consideration the very particular um, uh, uh, you know, uh, specificities of this tool, what, what it allowed us to do and what it didn't. Um, we generally have about 12 to 15 individual items within each collection and several collections within a larger section. Um, the collections on public health and on medical providers, um, therefore only can have about 30 total items in them. And we can't do justice to the complex fabric of this history with 30 items. We, we can't claim to, to be you know, exhaustive and encyclopedic here in that limited amount of resources. What we can do, however, is elevate uh, representative sources from multiple perspectives, um, as Leah alluded to in our presentation. And that's what we tried to do with these collections. Uh, you mentioned Robert Proctor's excellent book, The War on Cancer, which was very influential uh, to me as I was starting to conceive of these, because it did uh, cast uh, uh, into this interesting light how uh, there seems to be kind of a um, a positive and a negative to nearly every aspect of Nazi public health policies. Uh, uh, Marius, you had said how difficult it is for us to conceive that there may have been these seemingly positive aspects or, or any sort of um, progress made uh, for, for the betterment of, of people's health, because we know how terrible Nazi policies were for so many. Um, and yet it's like the, the flip side of a coin. Um, they devoted resources to one group at the expense of the others, or uh, in fact, uh, thought that others not only you know could be neglected, but were a direct threat and so targeted those groups. And that in turn uh, provided perceived benefits at least to a select population. Um, and that's an incredibly complex concept to get across. Uh, we didn't want to simply leave students with uh, the knowledge that they may have arrived with, that the Nazi public health policies neglected many people, that the Nazi uh, view of the world uh, targeted people uh, in certain ways and marginalized, excluded, and ultimately you know, led to genocide. Uh, but we wanted to show how much more complicated these things were. So we included uh, sources that showed um, exercise used uh, for propagandistic purposes in this seemingly positive light, like the video you've seen, as well as uh, Hitler youth training videos showing the kind of um, expectations for young men and, and the exercise that was prescribed for them, um, according to the regime's uh, kind of uh, paradigms. Uh, we also included, um, let's see, uh, photographs of uh, exercise used as punishment and public humiliation in prisoner of war camps. Uh, we included uh, testimony uh, from a man, uh, a Jewish man recalling how a doctor 
in a Jewish ghetto went to great, uh, great lengths and significant personal risk to secretly treat those uh, with infectious diseases because the German authorities um, were, um, were known to just destroy contagious disease hospitals and burning the patients alive often. Uh, because again, they cared not for these populations, but were worried about the potential threat that they saw adjacent populations having to their chosen population, the so-called Volksgemeinschaft, the Aryan race. Um, so we tried to provide this uh, really kind of wide ranging uh, 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 array of, of different perspectives and complicate the picture for students. You know, on the one hand, the photograph of, of prisoners of war being forced to do push-ups in the snow and rags. And on the other, we have a, a photograph of, uh, of an event at the a Berlin beach where uh, a public group is being led in, in calisthenics. And it looks um, like something very relatable to audiences today, I think. And these all stemmed from the same basic philosophy, which is really hard to understand. And uh, so we tried to provide this, this wide variety in order to be representative because we can't really do justice to such a complex history with our tool. Um, but we recognize that we're just one, uh, one kind of tool in the kit, so to speak. And uh, hopefully with the work of our colleagues and the other uh, divisions of the museum, we're able to provide a more well-rounded picture. Well, thank you for this uh, wonderful answer. Uh, thank you to all of you. Uh, and I, 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 I completely share that. You, uh, uh, and it, it connects to some of the discussions that's going on in the chat there uh, that Obviously, uh, on the one hand, uh, we have this um, image of the Nazi period and the Nazi regime we, we, we grew up with, or in some cases, like in my case, you know, my parents, grandparents, my grandparents suffered. Uh, they were in camps. And obviously, for me, it's a completely different story altogether. Uh, whenever I talk about the 1940s, uh, and it's the same, I suppose, to many Americans uh, whose uh, um, grandparents um, were uh, um, escaped uh, maybe luckily or didn't uh, uh, from the, the clutches of Nazism. So that's one thing, but of course um, the discussion is so complex and uh, the, the education is a perpetual um, mechanism. You know, people come and go, a new generation of, of uh, young students are arriving and there is this impetus to, to update the message, to integrate uh, more aspects of it. Uh, and um, that's never easy. And that connects to something that I want to uh, bring Zach into, uh, which is that he mentioned at some point, he's also a public historian. But that's, I think, is crucially important in this conversation. How do you combine your archival work, and all of you do amazing archival work, but at the same time, you do, do have that um, other capacity, if I may call it like that. You, you act as a public historian, and I think that's, that's equally important. And I want to maybe shift a bit the gear here and turn um, my attention to this um, important element of your work, which I don't want to uh, diminish in any way because I think it's crucially important as well. And maybe you could tell us something uh, in connection to how you relate that to the work you do for the institutions. And then in turn, and this is something uh, I pick up from the chat, what um, intra-institutional work now is happening I mean, this symposium is one example of these two institutions working about this particular aspect of history. And I think there are many other examples. Uh, and I'm curious to see whether you see here a possibility of crossing boundaries, moving uh, obstacles and um, pushing, pushing the, the, the baton uh, onto uh, newer and more provocative and daring subjects. Who wants to go first? Zach, can you start? Yeah, sure. So um, could, could you kind of just rephrase the question for me one more time, please? Well, simply put, it's just about the role of the public historian mm -hmm. um, and the importance uh, you or, and your colleagues uh, attach to it uh, in sure. addition to archival work. Um, sure, which, yeah. Oh, no, 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 thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I think like the way I think about it is, I mean, we've this, it's been mentioned several times that, you know, this history is so immensely complex. There's so much there. Um, and I think what really gets uh, comes across effectively to like a general audience or like a more public audience that doesn't have a strong background or an awareness of some of these subjects, which admittedly, like I'm not a trained historian of eugenics. Like 
I've only really been studying it um, since I came to the Institute with, um, with Chris Donahue. But I think what really connects is just finding the individual stories, whether it is of individual eugenicists or persons individually affected by, um, by these policies, by these practices, and really leaning into those stories and telling those as much as possible, as opposed to the sort of bigger narratives of a, a national movement or a global movement. And really, like, for example, I mean, most of the work I've done at the Institute studying eugenics has been studying Robert Cook, who's come up several times. And I think just through kind of pulling, kind of studying his individual story as a case study, you can just pull so many threads out of the larger eugenics movement into like a pretty, I don't want to say neat, but like linear narrative on how it's evolved over the, the past century. And I think just by focusing in again on like individual stories like that, you can really, really um, gain a lot of understanding for, for um, the public. Hmm. Thank you. Um, I can say from the, the museum's perspective, I mean, the group you're hearing from here really focuses on the undergraduate classroom uh, and to a certain extent, the graduate classroom, which I guess is a way of kind of is a different version of general public, if that's the way we want to think about it. Uh, and I know one thing that we've really thought about a lot is, you know, in what what type of resource and what uh, type of context makes sense. So I, I think a lot about what Mark was just talking about in terms of what our different resources can and can't do. Um, I'll maybe highlight one thing that we did um, in the past year or so that was very much geared towards our student general public and probably a wider general public as well. And that was a short 20 minute um, uh, lecture, recorded lecture that our colleague, Dr. Patricia Haber Rice pulled together, uh, together in conversation with Dr. Lutz Kelber uh, that really talked about um, eugenics kind of on both sides of the Atlantic, so to speak. So really thought about um, what was going on uh, Nazi Germany and even pre-Nazi Germany, as well as what was going on at the same at that same moment in the United States, and in many cases the communications between the two, um, and that was really meant to be something that was as short as we could make it, as digestible as we could make it. Uh, that again certainly doesn't give an exhaustive history, but is sort of one way in, um, or at least a place to start. Uh, and I, I, Catherine's linked the YouTube video right there. And uh, we also linked it to a number of other museum resources. So we're, we're kind of always looking for what's the right door in um, and what's going to kind of pique people's curiosity to learn more. Because no one thing, no one article, no one collection, no one lecture is ever going to explain this history in full. Right. So it's, it's a way of finding multiple points of connection, I think. So it's a two-pronged approach, I suppose. You try to teach them more about Nazi eugenics and Nazi developments, but at the same time, you try to teach them something about the connections between American and German eugenicists, which, of course, some people may know something about American eugenics, but I think they will be quite surprised to know how close connected some American eugenicists, not all, but some, were with uh, a Nazi eugenicist and how they promoted. I mean, you know, the famous uh, Nazi psychiatrist and one of the creator uh, of the Nazi civilization law, Ernst Rudin, uh, uh, comes to New York, of course, in 1932, to the Second International Eugenic Congress, and he's, he's elected president of the International Federation of Eugenics Organizations, promoted by Davenport and other important American eugenicists. So, by then, of course, uh, Rudin is in America uh, to promote what would become the Nazi version of uh, sterilization. And of course, he was very keen to explore the possibilities uh, of how they can learn from the American examples and from American sterilization programs. And there's, of course, there is an entire literature uh, on these connections, as you all know, but I suppose for the general public and for uh, younger people to teach about this is, is probably uh, a bit of a shock, uh, a bit of a sobering uh, moment when they realized that some of these connections were actually very well established. Um, Mark, were you next in line? Oh, you want me to move to the next question? Uh, no, I, I, I take just a moment to, uh, to echo uh, what Zach and Leah have said. I think that uh, when uh, trying to present these very important but complex ideas and this history to general audiences. I mean, the work of a public historian um, really centers around considerations of uh, accessibility, relevance, and interest. 
um, Zach mentioned individual stories, which is a strategy that, that uh, we've seen time and again, helps people to connect to, to complex history. Um, if somebody's reading something and can, can latch on and, and, and actually imagine that this person was experiencing this and it wasn't simply you know, some sort of inevitable march of time history as so many, too many people think of the past. Uh, but instead, uh, you know, a very present and immediate uh, flood of, of choices in quick succession and, and that things turned out the way they did, but they didn't necessarily have to. And it, we can tell that very well through individual stories. Uh, keeping it accessible and digestible is really very important. Uh, we uh, need to re remember at all times that most of our audience doesn't have, you know, the, the sort of academic background in these topics. To, to be bringing to the table the same sort of base knowledge about these events or political systems or what have you. And so it's uh, a challenge to try to provide that context, but to do it in a um, uh, you know, brief enough way so as not to you know, tire out the reader or the listener and, and to maintain interest until you get to that uh, really uh, more compelling part of the story. Um, so I think uh, Zach's point about individual stories is really excellent. And, and Leah mentioned that things need to be digestible and um, the audience needs to see some sort of relevance in them, even if it's not uh, as direct as the link between uh, German and American thinking on eugenics principles. Uh, but, uh, but even if it's more of, of just um, something that harmonizes with an interest that uh, the audience might have, something that's relevant to their lives in some way that they can actually you know, see themselves struggling with. Uh, I think that, that really helps to pique people's interest and makes the lessons uh, that much more easy to, to digest. Mm -hmm. Thank could you, add, Mark. Could I add really quickly Go what Go on. Mark is saying? Is that okay? Yes, of course. Go on. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, no, just one, one quick point. Um, yeah, I, I really agree with, with all of that. And I think one way to, to sort of approach eugenics, maybe from an educational standpoint, again, from to, to, to someone that maybe doesn't know much about this history is to sort of pose the eugenic argument, which I think in some ways makes it like, so like why it never seems to go away. Like, wouldn't it be great if we could get rid of diabetes, for example, or wouldn't it be great if we could get rid of th this disease? and sort of like pose that as like an appealing thing and then start to unpack the history of like, well, you know, this takes you down all kinds of rabbit holes um, that eugenicists have gone down historically, you know, and, 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 and just kind of start to unpack the history in that way to like, yeah, approach something from a, like a kind of modern relevant perspective and just kind of go backwards to like kind of understand all the complexities and problems that, that arise from something like that in terms of eugenics. Thank you. That squares very nicely with one comment made here uh, in the chat. And I want to uh, raise this with you uh, if I have uh, your attention. Um, and one, um, one person says, uh, with, I don't know um, the person's name, but um, he or she or they contributed greatly to this conversation and posted very important uh, comments. So I want to salute uh, that contribution. Anyway, um, so here we go. It's, it, it asks us to, to the following. How can we help educators hold the tension between the desire to move quickly in this moment of reckoning and the reality that the complexity of this history and its deeply embedded nature won't yield to a few good lessons or quick fixes? Mark, you already alluded to an answer to this question in your final comment uh, or previous comment, but um, I think that's, uh, that's something that we could all reflect uh, quickly uh, and maybe provide uh, an answer to. The comment is much longer here, and I can't uh, regrettably put it all uh, to you, but I think this is one important question we can pick up from this comment. And um, now I'll pick if we have time, maybe uh, one or two more before we close this. So who wants to... Uh, to answer that. Yeah, no one? Well, I might just add, if nobody's jumping in, that um, a very short answer could be incrementally, I think, is how we, we do this. Um, we can't ever really hope to do justice to the vast complexity of these very difficult concepts in a brief amount of time, but we can introduce the most important elements of them. Then we can build on that knowledge uh, 
hopefully, if we have more time with our audience, or we'll pique their interest enough to uh, inspire them to pursue their own education further onto the subjects. Yep. Thank you. No one else? Okay. Um, I can I can raise two more questions, uh, perhaps. Uh, although I suppose you may not feel necessarily obliged to answer uh, because um, the nature of it, but I would raise them anyway. But before I move to that, I have a comment which I want to highlight from uh, Robert Rester. He says, it is important, of course, uh, connecting to our conversation about the Nazi and US uh, uh, relationships to, uh, to make sure that we don't uh, create the impression that eugenics was bad because of the links to the Nazis. Eugenics is bad, even if it were a better world where the Nazi never existed. So I suppose we need to uh, bring that forward. Now, uh, one question, uh, uh, and it's interestingly, although it might seem weird, it is connected to uh, what uh, Mark uh, uh, highlighted in one of his comments, and then it was substantiated and added by, by Zach and, and, and Leah, uh, is that how do we tell this story? And one comment in the chat, uh, which... Uh, Feel free to answer if you can. Uh, I'm, I will we'll probably pick up later on in the general conversation is the following. You could be a eugenicist and not be a racist. And there were many eugenicists who were in racist, the way you define racism. I think at another level of conceptualization, Mark, I suppose it goes back to the conversation we had about Nazi public health um, and whether we can find any positivity there in Nazi public health and Nazi medicine that is not genocidal, is not racist. And I think the, 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 the conversation and the question comes from this um, uh, corner of our debate, whether we could and we should accept that there were eugenicists uh, who weren't racist. Uh, and that's, that's a moot point, of course, and not easy to discuss. But if you uh, feel in any way you could add something to this, um, by all means, please uh, intervene and say a few words. Yeah, I, I could start. Um, yeah, I mean, of course, that that's true. And, and I'll swing back to Robert Cook again, who I've studied extensively, who doesn't write about race and um, it is, is very, very, you know, conscious to avoid it. But I guess what I would say is, regardless, if you're sort of proposing or eugenic policies or practices, you are making a value judgment that is going to be imposed on other people, regardless of whether or not it's race-based, class-based, whatever. Um, it's still in some ways denying like the autonomy of someone, whether it's someone with a genetic disease um, or genetic disorder, um, you're making a judgment that is affecting this person without their, them being really involved in the, in the, in the decision necessarily. And, and that's problematic um, regardless. That, that's what I would say. Uh, that's that's a very that's a very good answer, Zach. Thank you. Uh... Yeah, yes, I'd agree with uh, Zach. Uh, certainly, it's um, there are examples uh, uh, in the history of eugenicists who did not ascribe to racist beliefs. Um, in the German context, uh, Magnus Hirschfeld, the the pioneering sex researcher and early advocate of LGBTQ plus rights, uh, he comes to mind. He was a eugenicist mm. who advocated for uh, the steriliz sterilization of certain people with disabilities, uh, but was uh, an egalitarian on racial lines and uh, was you know, considered very progressive for his day. Um, in the German context, in the 1920s and 30s, eugenics was referred to as racial hygiene, though. And so, as Zach mentioned, even if it's not specifically racist, making these sorts of value judgments based on whatever classification or parameters you want to ascribe to a person is problematic to say the least. And in the German context, because of the terminology applied and the specific understandings of that around the notions of race, it's hard to disentangle after a certain point if somebody could actually be a, an active eugenicist without maybe not being personally racist, but contributing to that racist system in some way or the development of it uh, because they began to become uh, rather entangled, to say the least. Yeah, thank you. Uh, that's something we haven't touched on, but I'm happy. Uh, uh, you mentioned Mag uh, Magnus Hirschfeld, of course, and I, I, I personally done uh, some work on uh, Jewish eugenicists 
in Eastern Europe. And of course, it is it's extremely problematic. Uh, and it's very difficult to read their texts, how they promote eugenics in the 1920s. Uh, and uh, many of them ended up in Auschwitz in the 1940s. And to see that, you know, uh, they were absolutely, and they're very anti-racist, of course, very much against German ideas of racial purity, German ideas of racial supremacy. However, uh, in the field of sexual reform, in the field of public health, uh, social hygiene, they promoted a lot of eugenic ideas, not only within the Jewish communities, but uh, at society at large as physicians uh, in countries such as Romania or Hungary or Poland. And of course, uh, that's an important aspect of it. And in relation to race and racism and eugenics, of course, uh, again, something we haven't discussed, and uh, I just want to briefly mention is the, 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 the complex conversation going on in other parts of the world. I mean, if we think of Central America or South America, well, of course, the discussion about race and eugenics is very different uh, in many ways than it is in, in Germany uh, or in the US. And uh, again, that adds uh, uh, just to salute those uh, of us or those uh, amongst us uh, who are, uh, are working on um, other parts uh, of the world, um, where the story, of course, and the relation between racism and eugenics is, is a very different one, or better said, it's a more complex one than people generally assume. Uh, so thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Mark, for that comment. It's important you brought that uh, example in. I think um, I think I need to check the time. Okay, we we have a, a couple of more minutes now. The questions and the comments are flowing in, and uh, I just want to ask something that may or may not be, um, uh, I suppose, uh, in your jurisdiction, as it were, but a lot of us are, are wondering, of course, um, whether. Um, politics plays any role in the way institutions react to uh, change and they come to terms with certain historical moments in the past. And of course, um, the comment, uh, one of the comments in the chat was about recent political developments in America. I mean, recent in terms of the past, say, seven, eight years, and whether there is any political pressure, as it were, to um, engage with certain issues or not engage with certain issues. At some point, Chris uh, mentioned quietism um, as, a, as, as, a, as a passive form of not engaging with uh, historical reckoning. Uh, so not that you don't care, you care, but you don't say anything. So there's a very interesting conversation going on here, I suppose, in relation to eugenics. And um, one of the questions and comment uh, alludes to that, whether uh, politics or political pressure may influence a decision certain institutions, for example, the museum may take regarding certain issues and obviously the National Institute of Health. Now, I can assume that this is not something you can answer easily and you, you feel uh, that maybe it's not for you to answer this question, um, but it, for the sake of honesty and transparency, I raise it uh, because it's being asked. Uh, in this panel, also because it connects to something that uh, Chris mentioned at the beginning of this uh, symposium and his comments about the ultimate uh, uh, need to uh, forcefully engage publicly with, with certain issues, irrespective of um, the political climate, I suppose. Um, I can I can make a comment. Um, I, I don't I don't want to answer it um, that question. I guess um, completely directly, but I'll just say in terms of. Um, the initiatives that we've taken at our institute over the past year. Um, I mean, we, I mean, our director, Eric, Dr. Green acknowledged, you know, in his opening statements that, you know, our institute has, you know, problematic ties to, to figures and, 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 and um, that aren't maybe necessarily directly related to eugenics, but are pretty close, you know, and th there's problematic history there. And I think this year we've really taken, we've, 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 really wanted to have an, you know, an active conversation about that and to start to reckon with it because it's something that we haven't really reckoned with and it feels important. And I mean, it just, it just speaks to us having this event, you know, that, that we, we want to take this seriously and we look to continue, um, you know, engaging with this in the, in, in the future. So that's not a direct answer, but I'll, I'll just say that. Yeah, that's that's absolutely uh, absolutely fine, and uh, of course um, we know um, that you know um, certain white supremacists uh, embrace eugenic ideas. There's a big debate about revivalism within that particular segment, uh, and uh, there is a 
a very important uh, discussion about whiteness uh, here and white fragility and all those sorts of things that at some point um, had time permitted would have been a, an important addition to this. But um, it's, uh, it's something that at least we, we, we are clearly aware of and we want to highlight. Uh, and um, regrettably, a time is not on our side. Now, before we close this, I want to I raise one final point. And if you have a second to react to this, all of you will be really nice. It comes from um, uh, one of our uh, uh, contributors uh, to the conversation. And um, he raises this interesting point about a, a particular tension that exists between sharing information. And, uh, you know, you are in the in that line of work, as it were, you share information with, with people who come to you. And how do you actually then, at the same time, construct knowledge about that particular information? And how do it, what do you do with that particular knowledge? Uh, there is a, a tension maybe there, or there is a, 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 a difficulty there. I don't know how you feel about that. Do you understand uh, what uh, the question is? is? Is it clear? That's the way I can see it here, but not sure. I I completely grasp it. The way I'm understanding it is um, there's like a certain dissemination of historical knowledge, and then there's also the formation of new approaches. Is that what this person is getting at? Yeah, I hope so. I hope so. I can see only the second part of uh, his his question, so I can't see the first part. So uh, he, he speaks of a of a tension uh, that exists between these two, and. Uh, I think I understood correctly this is what he's referring to. Yeah. So I can say for our part, uh, the kind of part of the museum that's represented here is the part uh, that works most with students and faculty uh, in more of a, a classroom capacity. That's what um, Catherine and myself do from the perspective of campus outreach. And it's what um, Mark does from the perspective of uh, the various digital assets that we have. Uh, but the museum also has uh, an entire apparatus, both within the Mandel Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies, as well as throughout the institution, uh, that supports scholars who come to the very extensive archives that we have to do exactly that, to produce new knowledge out of the materials that, that we have on site uh, and that one has access to in a number of different ways. Uh, and then we also uh, host many different types of um, lectures and panels and other types of programs that, that are also meant to do that. So I'm not totally sure I actually see a tension between the two. I think they complement each other in different ways. Uh, and it depends uh, who you're talking to and, and what you're looking at. And I would even say um, many times, many is the time in, in faculty seminars and really many is the time in the production of our digital resources, which we never do in a vacuum. We're always talking to um, outside uh, faculty uh, with whom we work, uh, where that's a very symbiotic relationship, right? Like we will learn things in the production, uh, in the conversation that happens in the room of a seminar. We will learn things in the production of a collection for experiencing history. So um, to me, those things go, can actually go hand in hand quite nicely. I don't know if my colleagues, Catherine or Mark, want to pick up on, the, on any part of that. Yeah, I, I was able actually to find the first part of the of the comment earlier. Uh, so, um, and uh, I don't want to run over. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, important, I suppose, to um, read it. So, uh, if Mark uh, or uh, Catherine want to add something, please go ahead. I don't want to cut you short. But um, then afterwards, I will I will read what uh, Milton Reynolds has to say in connection to that point. Uh, no, I think Leah summarized things nicely for us, Catherine. Go ahead. Okay, hold on a second because it's uh, now more questions are coming in. And right, so he says the following: the decoupling of racialization from the national project seems to prevent people from making the important connection between eugenic ideology and its continuity. This seems especially true in the way Americans have been socialized to think of racism as an individually transacted phenomenon, rather than being driven through ideology and policy. This is not to dismiss individual responsibility, but to address the challenges of this work. So I think it, it, the positivity that comes from the last sentence is that the challenges uh, of this work are important. And I think this is the, it's a nice way, I think, to end this panel uh, and your wonderful uh, contributions to accept that uh, there are challenges ahead and uh, there are probably many uh, challenges ahead, but we are ready to face them. 
Okay, well, with that in mind, uh, Chris, uh, I think we should say thank you to this wonderful uh, presentations uh, and to wonderful colleagues and to um, express my appreciation for this conversation. Um, and we can now move to a, a broader uh, discussion uh, where I invite all panelists to join in, please. Thank you, Marius. Uh, there are a number of points that I could bring up to start to begin the discussion. Um, I think, and because you've done such a, a wonderful job uh, uh, with this panel, I'm just going to ask um, Alex, uh, maybe you wanted to talk a little bit more about sort of the connections between uh, race, racism and eugenics. And, and your perspective on these issues, and we, we may we can start there. I know that was an issue that you wanted to raise. Well, thank you. I wasn't sure when to come in and turn on my video and unmute and all of that. So thank you for inviting me back into this final discussion. And I would say that um, there's a lot to unpack there as part of our ongoing collective work. And I think that was part of Milton's point that doing this work collectively is really is essential to the anti-eugenics project. And I would go back to some of the points that have been made about the centrality of disability and constructions of disability and ableism to really understanding the various, the multifaceted ways in which racism and othering happens in the context of eugenics. Um, so I don't know if I completely buy the argument that someone can be a eugenicist and not a racist. Um, I think there are multiple axes spinning at all times, and it's basically one step away. It's like three points of separation um, in terms of any times hierarchies are being constructed, the kind of modern world in which we live or the post postmodern world is so saturated in racial forms of othering and hierarchy that I think it's virtually impossible to pull a kind of, you know, um, like unadulterated kind of eugenicist out of that. So that's one comment. The second comment relates to the point that uh, Marius was making about looking beyond. We've talked, to, it seems like this, this has been fantastic. I've learned so much. We focused a lot, however, on kind of the U.S. and German experiences with maybe a few other examples with the formative kind of period of Galton and so on. However, there's a whole big world of other eugenic experiences out there. And we can think of, you know, Argentina or Brazil or, or also Mexico. Mexico is a really interesting case because in Mexico, they took up eugenics wholeheartedly after the Mexican Revolution, but spun it in a way that was pushing back against U.S. imperialism to embrace this idea of the cosmic mestizo race. So it certainly was a kind of racialization. It wasn't banked on white purity. In fact, it was trying to turn that on its head almost in a kind of reverse equation. So I think more pondering that, pondering that both in terms of what happened in other countries and the role of, for example, Jewish eugenicists or African-American eugenics in the U.S. is something we can continue to do to see some of the insidious ways in which continuities um, play out to this day. So I'll stop there um, because I'm sure others have think interesting things to add. Well, what I wanted to say, and Marius, of course, can, can jump in, is that uh, one of the, the areas, the geographic areas that I think poses a number of these questions and a number of these continuities quite well is so-called Eastern Europe. Uh, much of the uh, eugenics movements in the Czechoslovakia and, and also uh, uh, Croatian eugenics movements depend upon notions of, of anti-blackness that actually are directly from Davenport. Uh, and that is, uh, and that many of the ways in which the Czech eugenics movement functions is in deep con uh, with, uh, for example, uh, Franciszek Czada is, uh, he is uh, very influenced in many ways by G. Stanley Hall in terms of how he views the ideal or uh, the, the ideal organic Czech society. And so we haven't really talked about sort of the legacies of imperialism, of racism, of hierarchicalization, 
of the construction of whiteness and of blackness in uh, in these in these spaces in which there are very clear uh, connections between kind of the American eugenics movement and other eugenics movements in ways that I think have uh, that have deeply important relevancies for um, for historically marginalized communities in these geographies today. And Marius, th this is also something you can you can comment on. Uh, but I just wanted to, to say that quickly, that that is also a, a deep interest of mine and a deep concern of mine. Yeah, I think that's an important point. And thank you, Alex, for uh, uh, highlighting it again. Uh, we, we, we tend to look at this more or less as ideal ties. And of course, we believe that the Anglo-American and German models of eugenics were the only ones. And I'm happy you mentioned Mexico or Brazil or Argentina or Chile, um, where, of course, um, the French model of eugenics was very popular. Uh, and French science in general exerted uh, an extraordinary impact uh, uh, and, and French medicine and French public health uh, in these countries as much as it did, of course, in France. I mean, we haven't mentioned France. Uh, and the other model, of course, is the Italian uh, connection, to use the pun here. Uh, the Italian fascism, hugely important, and the whole discussion about naturalism uh, and demography, uh, People like Corrado Gini were absolutely hugely influential, or, or endocrinologists uh, like Nicola Pende, uh, who had an extraordinary career uh, in Central uh, and, and Latin America, and of course, as well as in Italy and Eastern Europe. So these are uh, people who contributed significantly to debates about uh, biotype, um, constitutional medicine, endocrinology, and how that filtered into eugenics. Uh, offering very different models. Um, Ross highlighted some of these issues in his paper on, on eugenics and homosexuality. And of course, endocrinologists contributed significantly to this debate. Uh, and they come from uh, areas uh, which uh, um, were not mentioned here, geographically speaking, because uh, you know we didn't have time. But it is important, at least here at the end, to highlight these differences and uh, different traditions and um, contributors, which are... I suppose, um, notable. Okay, so I also think um, another question to, to think about a bit more, and I think this is part of, I was going to talk about this in my, sort of the unanswered questions that, that have come out of this symposium in which we, we have a, a great deal more study to do on many of these topics, is really thinking about, um, uh, as Alex said, kind of how, uh, and as Milton is also pointing out, sort of how, dis I think really disability is something which fabrics the entirety of the, of, and notions of ability fabrics the entirety of eugenics movements. And Sander Gilman and others have, have talked about how uh, disability difference as pathology have, are really at the root of many of our, our prejudices and many of our stigmas. So I think this is something where um, really making, ensuring that, that all of these discussions about uh, eugenics and scientific racism depend upon a notion in which we understand that, any, that nor normalization and this typification of this very narrow sense of, of white kind of whiteness aesthetics or this Anglist it's kind of fetishized Anglo-Saxonism is at the root of, of many, many eugenics movements. And that includes um, a lot of discussion. So we focused on, on I think, uh, and Marius is good to pick this up uh, as well, and as, as well as our panelists, that um, there is a, a way in which we should also talk about eugenics and eugenics movements, not simply as as negative eugenics, but as positive eugenics, and also in a much more broader social framework, such as social ostracization and social stigma. Uh, there was, I, I, uh, there's a scholar who actually just gave a talk on, on, on basically on prejudice, on racism. Maybe you know this, this was on your Twitter, Marius, on, on sort of stigma as sight and smell, and how this is how we, we have many of these stigmas sort of unconsciously operating with under uh, with um, historically marginalized communities, and that this this 
is allows eugenics and allows sort of exclusionary potentials to function in the in the present with very little you know basically as as individual policy but as group policy but also as kind of state apparatus and i think that's uh, something that there is a, a, a danger, too, of uh, obviously the American focus is important because we are located uh, right outside Bethesda, Maryland. And that's I think it's also important because the eugenics movement in the United States is a, is a clear example for others. But I think making sure that practices, periods, periodization, uh, forms of eugenics are all equally represented and that that. Uh, we understand and in many ways the research on this has to be done. So that's I think my other question is is what more do we need to understand in order to to make sure that we are representative of the specificities of eugenics in all of its practices and not tied to geography? What barriers remain to that research uh, to pick up also on some questions? So where are the archives? How are they situated? What can historians do? Uh, what can scientists do to help historians? What can archivists do, uh, public historians, in order to get this, uh, you know, get this malicious fabric kind of more well known? Sorry for the long question. So, anyone would like to jump yeah. in? Uh, uh, no, that's that's a very good. But so before anyone jumps in, I just want now that you uh, put it in such a way, Chris, uh, which is, I, I appreciate. I just realized. We also need to push this conversation because you mentioned Czechoslovakia, for example, but obviously we talk about eugenics after 1950s, but we haven't mentioned a, a big chunk of the world, which was under communism and mm -hmm. how eugenics developed in the Soviet Union uh, from the 1920s onwards, uh, how it developed in Eastern Europe uh, in the you know, 50s and 60s and 70s, and the whole discussion about various marginalized communities and stigmatization. Uh, in Eastern Europe of certain communities, particularly the Roma, and how uh, eugenics survives and is recreated by uh, state socialism, uh, and how it it, it fuses uh, and it moves into uh, public health uh, programs and uh, educational programs, uh, uh, almost segregational educational programs under communism, which, of course, People uh, will never uh, go that direction, or very few historians will go that direction. So there is, there is need for that. Uh, incredibly important topics, I suppose, to bring it indeed. Now, in connection to that, I suppose we need to reach a point where we need to decolonize um, historical scholarship on eugenics. You know, to move uh, away from this um, idealization of certain uh, case studies and to uh, assume that those na master narratives. Uh, have the power that we historians attributed to it. And certainly it was attributed to them 30 years ago. I mean, um, some of us remember how the scholarship on eugenics looked 30 years ago. And you cannot imagine how, uh, you'll be very surprised if you look at how many uh, books were in eugenics in the 1990s uh, and how many books were in a comparative global eugenics in the 1990s, even more important. You could really count them on, you know, the three books out there. Uh, it was absolutely um, um, of, 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 of serious uh, uh, historical uh, research uh, imperatives. So um, we moved a long way, of course, now, uh, and we have the historical cases, we have the archives, and now it's time, I think, we move the conversation on another level, which is about, of course, the, 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 what we do with that information, what we do with that historical archives, what would reposition um, the people in this story? Uh, we need to bring the people back in. Uh, we need to bring those communities back in. We need to empower those communities that were targeted and allow that their dialogue with them to happen. Now, I said I would only jump in. So, Ross, I turn to you now right. because I see your hand raised up there. Thank you. Um, just a few, I, I guess, disconnected thoughts that resonated as, as you were posing the question, Chris. Um, which has to do with, with um, uh, different cultures of, of science and, and, and eugenics. Um, a problem that I've come across, it seems to be a general recognition from many of the panellists that have spoken on both days. There seems to be an acceptance or, and an awareness that eugenics is still with us today in different forms. Now, I'm sure we can all think of examples that are very, very 
familiar and that resonates with, with historical examples and expressions of, of, of eugenics. But there are also some that modern genomics and modern science that are new and they won't necessarily look familiar, um, particularly with the complexities of science. I mean, I, I, I involve myself with today's um, uh, publications. There's been one this week um, called Sexual Orientation, Neuropsychiatric Disorders and the Neurotransmitters Involved. Um, now, I, I look at that title and I, I, I get, you know, I understand, I, I can see there's something going on there that's going to be of great interest. Um, and I, I, I find resonances with, with eugenics. But it's taken me 15 years and a PhD to get to that point. And in terms, of, especially in the light of the discussions in the last panel about making very complex subjects um, uh, relevant and, and that speak to different audiences that have not necessarily got 15 years and a bit of PhD's worth of experience. So I guess just, just to throw this out, I, I, I don't have an answer to this. It's, it's a problem that I've come across in terms of um, recognising um, what's going on today, just in, in, in quite a niche, niche field. But in terms of making um, you know, uh, projects and endeavours of the kind that we've uh, been discussing, particularly in the last panel, um, and, and communicating um, histories of eugenics um, in a way that is relevant, how can we do that when there is this very, very large um, body of, of scientific experience that is actually really incredibly inaccessible and um, it's just uh, um, uh, unintelligible to most people? I'm, I'm only going to throw that out there. Like I say, I don't have an answer to that. It's something that I, I've worked on very hard in my own little, little corner of, of, of historiography. Um, but I, I still don't feel that in, in other areas, I would recognise expressions of eugenics that are playing out today. Yeah, I think uh, in 2021, eugenics may wear a different dress, but it is not new. Uh, and I think that's something that uh, is clearly the case here, right? Um, it's, it's a very different type uh, of uh, eugenic uh, thinking, behaviour and practice, I suppose, uh, to some extent. We discussed yesterday certain uh, articles that were published in prestigious scientific journals, which try to rehabilitate to some extent the word race in other ways uh, or in other forms, um, the whole discussion about eugenics. Um, and I'm not talking here about all debate on liberal eugenics and uh, neo eugenics and uh, this uh, human enhancement and the conversation, which we haven't even um, engaged with here. But like you pointed out, Ross, I mean, you, you recognize immediately uh, certain patterns or tropes of eugenic thinking because you know the history of that particular uh, uh, line of reasoning and how it intersects, how it intervenes in the life of individual, how it tries to blur the boundaries between private and public and be violent, basically. It is a violent way of interfering with your life. And I suppose knowledge of the history of that um, and knowledge of the history of eugenics would help identify, would help you identify better, I suppose, uh, those, um, those moments. Uh, all of us uh, go through that. And uh, regrettably, I suppose, and this is the reasons why uh, today and yesterday we were so, I suppose, in, in, in febrile and uh, um, energizing conversation is that um, we hear those tropes or those, those eugenic uh, flickerings um, constantly now, um, whether it is in relation to COVID or, or before it was in relation to certain political activities of various uh, people, uh, or it is on a daily conversation on the street. You surprise yourself listening to a conversation on the street and you hear people talking in a way that is so consonant or commensurate with patterns of eugenic thinking you thought belonged to the history books. So Marius, unfortunately I have to uh, close this discussion because we actually have to close the conference, um, the, this symposium. And I just wanna make sure that uh, our, our colleagues from the US Holocaust Memorial Museum is there, are there any kind of 15 or 20 uh, second uh, contributions that you can make uh, to for this discussion um, before I officially close out the conference with 
uh, some themes and a, and a brief thank you. Um, I think all that I would say is that uh, this has been a really rich conversation. I think this shows how much uh, we have to learn, how much we have to learn from each other, um, and um, how many different types of resources and different types of conversations um, are, are out there to be had. So I thank you for the invitation and for um, bringing us into this conversation this afternoon. So thank you. Thank you, panelists. Uh, uh, thank you, Marius. Uh, I'm simply going to, with three minutes, uh, make a few remarks, and then I will uh, turn it over to Marius for some final a few remarks of his, and then we will officially end this fantastic and deeply moving event. Um, so I, I think uh, we've talked about some of these themes, but I want to make sure that uh, there is indeed a uh, sort of some summation of, of many of the things that we have tried to bring together in this meeting. I, I think there's a clear narrative about state power and its limits in eugenics. I think there's a clear narrative as both as the community in the context of eugenics is both coercive and defensive, uh, capable of, of resisting eugenics. I think there's a clear discussion, particularly in Johanna's work and in Natalie's work on uh, agency and resistance in the context of eugenic sterilization. And I think we all always need to make sure that whenever we talk about eugenics, whenever we talk about eugenics methods, we're talking about individuals whose social futures are profoundly changed or whose, whose lives, whose autonomies are, are ended in many ways. Um, I think uh, clearly there is a, a discussion of, of, about ableism and about unreal aspects of humanity that eugenics seizes upon with its easy solutions to social problems, um, ideas of fitness and ability and function that need to be further examined. Uh, the question of pseudoscience and eugenics is, is pervasive in all of our discussions. Um, the importance of confronting eugenics and the role of history and historical scholarship is another theme. Um, ideologies of race, nation, and social class and how they function in the context of eugenics practices and eugenics ideas. Um, obviously, the importance to, for two last things of uh, confronting eugenics and of rehumanization as eugenics is inherently dehumanizing. And I think also, as we, as we pointed out with the discussion with Rob and Marius, that, that confronting past history of eugenics or of scientific racism is, uh, is in a dialectic, a dynamic with building trust in science. So if you are a scientific institution, you build trust through confronting your history in an honest, transparent way that one uh, is closely and intimately connected to the other. Um, Again, in terms of uh, unanswered questions, uh, other perspectives than in the US perspectives are really essential. Uh, there is a great deal to be gained from an American focus, but there's also limitations. There's other eugenic practices such as stigmatization and social ostracism. Uh, uh, the, the pseudoscientific sort of, whether eugenics is pseudoscientific and in what context, is it scientific in what context, during what period, who, uh, uh, whom is uh, speaking and writing is very important here. Emphasizing disability as a fundamental narrative is another unanswered question. And I think there's a deep concern over contemporary eugenics, the use of uh, emerging technologies for the purposes of eugenics, uh, furthering eugenics ideas or practices, contemporary uses of, uh, uh, this is a deep concern. Um, I also think there's a, there's a real concern, too, about intelligence testing, uh, genetic studies of social behavior, of, comp of using genetics in order to gain some insight into complex social life, into, into, human, uh, into human specificity and, evolution, uh, and um, uh, individuality is, is, is something which has really come back into the contemporary conversation of many of these issues. And I think this is uh, one of many things that we will hopefully try to address in, a, in future meetings and future forums. We certainly are going to have a follow-up uh, question and answer uh, discussion forum uh, with our panelists, as well as some, some other guests. Uh, we know that 
I think there was 150 questions, something like that. We know we have not answered all of your questions. You know, this is a complex discussion, which is rich in meaning and significance and that we, we were not able to get through all of it today. So we will ha be having follow-ups of one of which is a, is a uh, discussion forum, hopefully sometime in January. Um, from my perspective, I'd like to thank our audience, our panelists, our moderators, the NHGRI, and especially the communications branch here, including Sarah Bates, Brit uh, Brittany Kish, um, our fantastic behind the scenes uh, AV people, uh, Gerald Simani and Alvaro Encinas. And with that, I will, and also Marius as co-convener, I thank you and I turn it over to you for uh, you, any final thoughts that you have, although we're a little bit out of time. <laughs> So, yeah, uh, no, I, I think you've done a brilliant job, uh, not only uh, putting it all together, Chris, but also throughout the symposium. I'm, I'm very grateful to you and to NHGRI and to your colleagues. Uh, it's been a momentous occasion and I really felt that something was um, building and that we are moving forward uh, in, in ways previously um, uh, unthinkable. So that's that's remarkable. And just a day before our symposium started, um, President Gail Jarvik, president of the American Society of Human Genetics, issued a very important statement uh, on December the 1st. And if I'm not mistaken, I think she, um, Gail was uh, with us yesterday. And she says that as scientists, we must continue to be visible in our rejections of eugenics and racism, and we must be honest in addressing human genetics past. So this statement coming from the uh, American Society of Human Genetics and this symposium, I think prove, amongst many other things, that transformative change is possible. Scholarly debate is important, but so too is action, and the time to act is now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Have a good evening, everyone, and a good weekend. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye.